So we're pleased to have with us tonight Mr. John Gore to give tonight's address. And I ask now for your kind and careful attention as he presents, Do You Believe the Gospel Abraham Believed? Mr. Gore? Thanks, Matthew, and good evening to you, ladies and gentlemen. It's nice for you to be able to come out tonight, and uh, your presence here shows to me that you, know, you have an interest in, in the scriptures of truth, and so tonight I hope we can uh, work through what I consider to be a very important theme uh, within the scriptures. Now as we go through, what, what I'd like to introduce to you first and foremost is Obviously, with a uh, topic such as we have with Abraham, uh, we are dealing ultimately with a figure who, whose life is recorded in the Old Testament. And uh, what we're going to be doing tonight, though, is spending a lot of time in both the Old and New Testament. And the reason for this is a simple basis that you cannot separate the Scriptures, the Old and the New, and what I hope we'll see tonight as we go through this resoundingly is that the scriptures complement themselves and they help to build on, on each other and we'll, we'll sort of be skipping around a little bit to, to show um, and get explanations. Some things that are recorded in, in Genesis and the promises to Abraham directly, uh, we have great explanations of uh, what was meant in the New Testament, in the teachings of Paul. So first and foremost, this is a Bible study and we aim to use as much of the Bible as we can. Uh, I, I hope that what you'll see is, is that we're reinforcing this from Scripture alone. This is not you know, self-interpretation uh, on my part. You know, this, this is uh, what I hope you'll see is very resoundingly uh, the Scriptures supporting itself, giving us um, very clear threats um, on uh, what the gospel that was given to Abraham was and hopefully along the way we're able to challenge you know, our, our own understandings, maybe expand our, our, our knowledge a little bit just on who Abraham was and what the gospel that was given to him entails and of course ultimately how does it affect us. So what we're actually going to do then is we're going to start and uh, if, if you have your Bible with you, I, I invite you to please open it up and, and uh, turn to the, to the different uh, passages of Scripture that I'll be uh, alluding to. But I do have it up on the screen, and it's probably going to be for a timing uh, uh, factor, but please you know, make notes, get them down, and, and test this later on to make sure you know, that um, what we're saying is obviously accurate, um, and to be able to look at these things more deeply yourselves later on. Um, sometimes we'll be referring to verses, um, you know, from, from a passage without going into the context. And from a biblical scholar's point of view, that's generally what I would consider to be a no-no. It's not something that you can just go in and pull out one verse out of, a, out of a whole chapter or out of a whole book without knowing what the context of it is. And so, again, I, I challenge you to take, take notes, write down these references, and, and go home and read the rest of the chapter, read the rest of the book in, in order to be able to get the full flavor of what is being discussed. From a timing standpoint, obviously, uh, it would be impossible for us to take on you know, chapters and, and books all in, in one evening. So I hope you'll look for that to me tonight. So what we're going to do then is we're going to start with the biblical reference in Galatians 3 of where it tells us specifically that the gospel was preached to Abraham, was given to Abraham. This is the, the reference from Galatians 3, verse 8 and 9. The scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed, so then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. And really tonight, this, these two verses to me encapsulates why we're all here, obviously. Um, this word heathen there in, in verse uh, 8, um, and this illusion of all nations uh, refers to us. 
is ultimately uh, where we'll be looking uh, and going tonight with this is that there is an extension past what Abraham was told and what he believed and what he dedicated his life to. There is an extension. And we're going to see this by looking at what Abraham was told specifically and then going to places such as uh, Galatians 3 where the Apostle Paul went to great pains to, to uh, describe the fact that yes, Abraham was taught the gospel, it was given to him in the form of promises. And in fact, that's what we have here. Oh, wrong button, that's a good start. Okay. Um, is preached the gospel on Abraham, saying, "In thee shall all nations of the earth, or all nations, be blessed." That's a, a direct quote from the promise that was recorded to to Abraham back in Genesis chapter 12, which we'll look at in a little while. <clears throat> so, you know, at once once again, reinforcing there is a very clear connection between Old and New Testaments, and we'll be going back to the forwards to reinforce, um, and and in some instances. To, to learn just what exactly is meant there. But the all nations refers to us, so it's, it's a hope that is extended to others outside of his uh, descendants. And in fact, uh, verse 9 says, they which be of faith. So these, this word of faith is, is in fact helping us to focus in on well, what does it, if, if I want to become a person, what do I need? Or who are these people? And people who are faith uh, is a characteristic that defines a group um, that have embraced the, these promises that were given to Abraham. So, <clears throat> just some, uh, I think, simple foundation steps to get us underway then. Uh, in these two verses, we have obviously the word gospel, which uh, most of us grew up hearing the word gospel if you were somewhat religious or yeah, I, I'm from Australia, which is basically not religious at all, but I still heard it, you know, um, and, and it was something that people knew was associated with religion. And uh, if you grew up in a religious family, you would know that the gospel is really a fabric. It's, it's a very important part of a, a family, um, a community's beliefs is the gospel and, you know, the gospel's connections to uh, the Lord Jesus Christ as taught predominantly in the New Testament. And in fact, the word gospel doesn't even appear uh, as gospel in the Old Testament at all. You, if you were to do a search, you wouldn't find it um, in that way. And what I've done is, is show down here, if you can read Greek, then congratulations, I cannot. Um, but what this Greek word here um, means uh, is uh, gospel. So in English, it's a translation. Obviously, uh, the, the New Testament was written originally in Greek, so we, we have available Greek texts to be able to refer back to. Obviously, it wouldn't be much help to me anyway, since I'm, uh, I don't read Greek. Um, so we do have some very good translations in English to help us get through this. But this word gospel, which essentially means good news or the announcement of good news. So Abraham, effectively here, was preached good news, saying in the all nations will be blessed. And so what we're going to do is look at just what exactly the good news was and why, in a lecture title that we had tonight, do we need to know the good news that Abraham was told to? Because ultimately what we, we aim to do is to show you that the gospel that perhaps you're even familiar somewhat with from the New Testament teaching <coughs> of our Lord Jesus Christ and the apostles was actually also preached back in the Old Testament as well. And so we're going to create that, that thread together. <coughs> oh, here we go. Alright, so Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13. Notice we're, we're not going very far away um, uh, from the, the teachings of Paul this time. Galatians 3, verse 13 and 14 say these words Christ hath, hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Curse is everyone that hangeth on a tree. So there's this connection that I want to emphasize right up front is that the, the work of the Lord Jesus Christ in personal sacrifice, in giving his life away, 
is very closely connected with the blessings of Abraham. And it's being reinforced right here in these two verses. The work of the Lord Jesus Christ and the blessings that were given to Abraham. Very closely connected. Okay? So we have Christ's work in verse 13, verse 14 then, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. That we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Okay, so there's a lot of action words going on here I just want to point out. But um, we'll start with uh, this word here, that the blessing. Okay, that the blessing, um, again, Greek, Greek down here, but what it means is, is the speech or the good, good speech or essentially the good news. So it's, very, it's this idea again of uh, the gospel that is preached, that is, that is uh, expounded, um, was also given to Abraham. Uh, and he heard it. it was good news to him as well. And we're actually going to see that the, the Lord Jesus Christ also points this out, that Abraham, when he heard this good news, he looked forward to the day when I would be on the earth, and, and he was glad. So there's this connection of, this is great news. This is something that people desire to hear, desire to be a part of. And that's the connection that I wanted to make here, is, is that we might... This is also something that applies to us, that we might receive the promise of faith, of, of the Spirit, through faith. And again, there's that action word, through faith. This is a characteristic that becomes very clearly defined, that people who are able to partake of the blessing of Abraham through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ are people who have this characteristic of faith. Okay, so you can see we're already starting to, to basically create this, this thread through um, these writings here. This word promise, again, um, in, in looking at, at the Greek, means an announcement or, or a pledge um, specifically used um, in, in this context as a divine pledge. This is a God-given pledge that we will go back and look at this in Genesis in a minute. This is a God-given pledge. It was given to Abraham. So, in terms of how solid is the foundation of this pledge, it's God Himself who has made this pledge. It is immovable. It will happen. And that is the characteristic of faith. That, humanly speaking, faith is, is one of those things that's, that's hard to, to just have. It's something that you have to develop through trust or whatever it is. And in a lot of instances, faith is something that's a challenge for a lot of us. But we have the solid foundation that this, these promises that were given to Abraham and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ and his dedication shows to us that there is something extremely solid that we can base our hope, our faith on and embrace um, the promises that were given. <clears throat> So the, the word uh, faith down here is the Greek word pistis, uh, which means persuasion, that is uh, credence or moral conviction. It's not just something that we say, yeah, I have faith. It's something that is ingrained within us. It moves us. We, we make decisions on it. We talk to people. We, we choose to live our lives in a certain way, in a godly way. It, it, it becomes part of us. It's not just an academic decision that we decide to make, to have faith. This is something that becomes part of our life. Okay, and that's, that's what this persuasion is here. And it's a moral conviction of religious truth or the truthfulness of God um, or a, a religious teacher or teaching. Um, and it shows uh, the religious connection here is reliance upon Christ for salvation. And that's that's the part that, you know, when we talk about the promises, when we talk about the gospel, we're reinforcing the fact that, well, what do we want to have to do with the gospel? Well, we want salvation. We're, uh, we're, we, we desire the same things. Um, and we'll look at that in a little bit, what exactly we're hoping to be saved from. Um, but as of right now, it, what we're reinforcing here is that this is something 
that becomes part of us. We, we desire this, we live our lives to it. I just wanted to pop this up because at this point in time, I'm start, I've started with a number of different things and I, and I really want to reinforce them all as we go through. Um, that the, the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles. And as we know, the Gentiles um, uh, are really defined as anyone who is non-Jewish or non-Hebrew. So anyone who is a Hebrew is connected um, by descent, by family, um, to Abraham. Um, but the promises, the blessing, the, 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 the good news that Abraham was given um, is available to the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. And there again, we're reinforcing this great connection between the good news that Abraham was taught and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. They are one and the same. And we as the Gentiles are able to embrace that. That we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. <clears throat> so in Galatians 3, in verse 7, uh, once again it's the Apostle Paul who taught, Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. So now you're starting to not just have a, a connection through, through faith, um, and that, that's where the relationship stops. Now we're introduced to another term where people who are of faith are considered to be the same as or, or, or are the children of Abraham. So there's now a family uh, theme that's being brought into this. It, you're not just talking about Gentiles and Jews and their separation. There's, in fact, unity between them. Faith becomes the vehicle, which is the first point that I've got uh, underneath it in between right here. Faith is the vehicle which allows both Jews and Gentiles to inherit the promises um, through, through the words of the Gospel. God views faithful people, my second point here, as children or heirs of Abraham. So it's not just the physical descent um, uh, that, that is important, but God, God is looking at faithful people and he views them as children of Abraham. Faith, no, sorry. Uh, faith, human characteristic that God recognizes. And what I mean by this is that in order to be called a child of Abraham, it's this characteristic of faith that God recognizes for that to happen. Paul, Paul argues, um, and if you were to go through, through Galatians, you would see this in a little more detail. I'm going to put this down again. Um, who argues that it's not just good enough to be a descendant of Abraham physically. It, it requires more than that. So his argument is to the Jews. You know, you just can't say you're, you're a child of Abraham and therefore you inherit you know, the, the promises. It's more than that. Faith is a human characteristic, the only human characteristic that God recognizes. And, and Paul argues that specifically to the Jews, saying you have to have faith as well. You've got to believe in this. You can't just say it. You have it by right. Romans 4, verse 12. And the father of circumcision to them. So this is talking about Abraham here. The father of circumcision again uh, to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had being yet uncircumcised. So in Romans again, Paul presents this argument to the Jews and saying, look, you know, you can say that your father is the father of circumcision, and you're all circumcised, and anyone who's not is a part of this, not true at all. In fact, Abraham chose to walk in faith. He believed God before even he was circumcised. 
So you, you can't have circumcision or this, this sign of circumcision that, that the Jews try to take on as, as being the symbol of inheritance. Um, Paul says, no, you, you, you can't do that. It takes more. It takes faith in order to do that. You have to walk in the steps of the faith as Abraham did. So what we're beginning to see in being reinforced in the teachings um, of the New Testament is that there is this consistency about um, what the gospel is, what the gospel contains, and who is able to embrace it, who, who is able to, to partake of, of uh, what that good news is all about. So Romans 15 verse 8, I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. And Acts 15 verse 7, when there was much disputing amongst, and this was a, a, a Jewish um, congregation at this time, Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, ye know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So here we have the Apostle Peter, we have um, the teachings of the Apostle Paul, all saying that Gentiles have, through the characteristic of faith, the ability to be able to partake of, participate in, the good news that was given to Abraham. So we've reinforced, I think, the promises to Abraham is the gospel. They are one and the same. And it's an inheritance to those who, through faith, the characteristic of faith that God recognizes, may participate in it. And I've got a number of uh, other Bible references down the bottom um, that all, all serve, again, to kind of reinforce um, what I've uh, just gone through, um, but we're not going to take them all on, there's, there's a lot more, um, but those are some, some key ones there, so I definitely invite you to get all those down, um, if you miss them, uh, we, we can go back later on afterwards and, and you can collect those up. So I'm going to move along then, and just reinforce what we've been through with these key words here, promises, faith, inheritance, fathers, blessing. Abraham and Gospel. Now these are all words that we've uh, gathered from those New Testament quotations we've looked at. What we're going to see is when we go back to the Old Testament, these same words are coming out of here. So you're going to get uh, a consistency across what the words mean and how they are applied together. Okay? So <clears throat> the promises, God's promise, the fathers of the nation of Israel, which is Abraham and in his son Isaac and Jacob, um, the fathers of the nation, these promises were given. And the Jews, remember, were a little blinded by that because they thought, well, this is very exclusive. This is just for us because Abraham is our father. And remember, the argument was, well, no, that's not the case at all. It takes more than that. It takes faith, which is, of course, our second word. The promises were given because of faith and can be inherited because of faith. It's more than just to the Jews alone. Uh, the fathers were Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, um, as is often recorded in, in the scripture. You'll find those names together. Um, uh, Abraham is referred to in scripture as the father of the faithful, and he was the first Hebrew, uh, which means a uh, crossover, or someone who, as you, as you might remember, was at one point in time uncircumcised. He was given the promise that he became circumcised, he became the first Hebrew. Okay? So these are just some, some uh, keywords. I'm sure you're probably you know, somewhat familiar with them, but it's good to just get a, a, an understanding, perhaps, of um, the scriptural perspective on, on them as well. So we have also the gospel, which was preached to Abraham and was repeated throughout the New Testament um, teachings. Uh, this word blessing, remember, uh, that we, we looked at. And what we're going to do now is instead of just defining what it is, we're going to Say, so, okay, well, let's go back and look at the Old Testament and, and look at what exactly Abraham was told uh, and, and build, build our understanding of what the promises were that were given to Abraham. So our question is, what are the details of the blessings? And then the last one is, 
he was uh, given the promise of inheritance. What is that inheritance? Because as we've seen from, from Galatians, those who are of faith have the ability to also uh, partake of that inheritance. So what exactly is it? What is the inheritance that Abraham was given? Okay. So what then, which will be our question as we go back to the Old what was the gospel that was given to Abraham? <coughs> now, uh, here's some facts. I, I don't know, is that easy enough to read from the back? Alright, well, I'll go through them anyway, and um, hopefully you can see them from back there. Uh, th these are some facts, and once again, I'll provide all the scriptural uh, references. So, you know, write, write them down, check them out. We're not going to be able to get to them all, which I apologize from a timing standpoint. Um, but once again, I want to reinforce to you when I was making these things up, it is it's coming from scripture. Um, and, and uh, you know, pr prove it for yourself, absolutely. So Abraham facts. Uh, one, he originated from Ur of the Chaldees. Um, and there's, there's a number of references that show us uh, that was his origin. And I've got a little pointer over here. But, um, you know, here's my finger. How about that? So uh, Ur of the Chaldees is over here close to, to what, uh, it's in the area of uh, Iraq as we know it today. Um, not far from Baghdad, um, uh, right over here. This is, this is Israel, the Mediterranean Sea, right over here. So you can see um, there's a fair uh, expanse of, of uh, land that, that is between where Abraham started um, in Ur of the Chaldees and, and eventually where he's going to end up, which we'll look at uh, in a moment. So um, the second point there is that Abraham had been in a place where they had previously served other gods before his calling, his introduction to, uh, to the God, the creator of, of the universe, um, he had served other idols, other gods that uh, this uh, community over here in, in Chaldea, in, in Ur, um, that believed. Of, of course, they, it was an idolatrous God and it was not recognized by God, the creator of the earth. Um, so Abraham, at one point in time, was without knowledge of, of who God was. And he was given the promises and given the, uh, the challenge to remove yourself from the situation you're in. We're going to look at that in a moment as well. He, uh, he was initially challenged to move to Canaan. That was essentially the, the, uh, the end uh, game of, of uh, end plan of the game, which was to move into this area here in Canaan. And initially, though, he moved with his extended family, uh, which included his dad and, and brothers, um, and his wife and, and, and um, nephews, etc. Moved from here and, and came up here to Hayrin. And you kind of think, well, that's, that's a fair way to kind of out of your way. Uh, why would you do something like that? Um, I think, I know it's kind of green and bluish here, but this one gives us a reason why, and that is, is that this is all desert and it's very difficult to cross, um, whereas up here, this is known as the Fertile Crescent, um, which is where inhabitants are, this is where people are, this is where merchant trade routes, etc., um, all feature through this area here, so it's, it's kind of a natural inclination to, to, to travel in a less hostile environment. Um, and you know that's that's probably the reason why there's there's no straight direct cut across there um, at all. So naturally, you know, back in those days when you're riding a camel, you're not really thinking about what's going to take you, you know, four hours to get there or whatever. You don't think like that. <laughs> you're thinking in camel time, not <laughs> GPS time, I guess. <laughs> so initially, he moves up here with his family, and he ends up losing his father. Um, and uh, at that time he's, he's given the challenge again to remove himself to where God had said, this is where I want you to go. Um, I, I said in point three over there, he, he was held up. He was held up because he moved with his family and then eventually he was actually challenged, look, you, 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 need, to, you need to remove yourself from your family and, and from your country. And, and come to a place that I'm going to show you. And that's what we had there in point four. He'd been given the promise in Genesis 12, which we're going to look at now, 
Um, and he finally leaves his father's house, which is uh, part of the, the, the challenge that he had to, to take on was, was to leave. And he moved to a, a new country. And this happened, um, we're given, given his age at this point in time, he's 75 years old. Um, and we know that he went on to, to, uh, to live well into uh, his hundreds. Um, so maybe 75 years isn't a direct comparison to how we might, might feel at 75 if we need to on such a journey. But uh, at this time, he, at the ripe age of 75, uh, made the decision to go down into Canaan where God had said, look, if you go here, this is, I'll promise I'll give this to you. So in, in Genesis 12, uh, if you have your Bible, I invite you to turn it up, Genesis 12, we're going to spend a little bit of time here. Genesis 12, he enters um, the land of Canaan through the plain of Moriah, as is recorded in uh, Genesis 12, verses 5 and 6. And in verse 6 it says, uh, Abram passed through the land of the place of Shechem, Unto the plain of Moriah and the Canaanite was then in the land. So Abraham ends his, his great journey from, from Ur all the way to this promise, um, to this land of promise that had been given in Genesis 12. <clears throat> Once again, not super clear, I'm sorry about that. Well, it looks not clear from here. Is it clear back there? Yeah, right. I won't worry about that too much. Okay. So, Here's, here's a couple of uh, additional facts. He passed through Canaan until he reached a place between Bethel and Ai, which, uh, just to get your bearings, this, this little map cut out here is the map of Israel that you're probably somewhat familiar with. Um, and then this section here um, is really the spring circle. So you can see a little bit of the Dead Sea, which is this little body of water here. Um, where we're talking about this little area here between Bethel and Ai that, that Abraham came down and, and pitched his tent there in, um, in the land of Canaan. And uh, the, the seventh point that I have there, which is uh, recorded in Genesis 12 and verse 8, he, he removed from there and to a mountain in the east of Bethel and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he grew it an altar um, unto the Lord and called upon the name of, of the Lord. So verse 7, the Lord appeared to Abram and said, unto thy seed will I give this land. And he built an altar there. So we start to now get into the promises that were given to Abram. And as we go through Genesis, we're going we're gonna to go to a number of references within Genesis just chapters that surround the story of Abraham, we're going to see a number of these promises that were given to Abraham. We're going to kind of fill them out a little bit, just, just so that we can see, um, build up, um, as it were, a list of what these promises entail. So we have, first and foremost, this promise of land um, that, that we just read about in Genesis 12, and verse 7 and 8. Now I want to go back to the beginning of Genesis chapter 12, and we're going to look at these, uh, these verses here specifically because this is what's referred to as the first uh, great promise that was given to Abraham. Um, there's a lot of detail in it and it's very multi-faceted, multi, multi it's the Australian country, sorry. Um, so there's, there's a lot of parts to it. We're going to go through it slowly so that um, you know, we can kind of point these out as we go along. So Genesis 12 verse one, I'll read through verse 4. Now the Lord said to Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred, from thy father's house, to a land that I will show thee. I will make thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So Abram the father, as the Lord had spoken in the Lord went with him, and he was 75 years old. Okay, so there's, there's that time reference to his age um, in verse 4 there. I want to go back and look at verse 2 and verse 3 because what we have here are uh, some of uh, the characteristics of the blessing um, of the promises that were given to Abraham. And the first is, um, I will make of thee a great nation. 
And uh, this, this here is, I've, I've, I've got a book on the other side there, um, is a national promise. This is, this is a national promise. It doesn't just involve Abraham. It, it involves a nation that, that, that come from him. It's his, it's his family that, that, that develops into um, and becomes a, a great nation. Um, so there is a national promise. And this is, um, in a lot of instances, um, connect, connected to uh, what the Jews were being challenged by uh, Paul in, in the New Testament because they felt, oh, wait a we are that great nation. We have the national promise, you know, and, and uh, it's, it's by the right of circumcision that, that we've been given that and um, we're special people. Um, so there, there is definitely, without question, a, a national uh, <coughs> promise that was given to Abraham. Um, the next one is, and I will bless thee and make thy name great. And this is a personal promise. Um, once again, I've, I've got some quotations on the other side. I'd love to be able to turn them up. We're going to run out of time, so I, I'm going to keep looking, but please write them down. Um, so here we have the, the, the part of the, this uh, promise that is very personal to Abraham. He, he's, he's been given um, a, a blessing, um, and his personal name will be made great, and, and he will be a blessing. The third part of this promise is this. I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. Now this is a very interesting uh, portion of the promise, because it's, it's a portion that involves people who are actively engaging with Abraham and with the promise. Okay, so you've got people who actively are saying what Abraham was promised, I want to be a part of. I want to be able to inherit as well. Now, it's okay if you're a Jew, because you can say, well, I'm not a second. But if you're a Gentile, how, how could you do that? Well, it's built in to this promise that was given to Abraham that there are those who can be connected to Abraham because of their attitude, because of their willingness to engage in this promise. I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curse thee. Now I've called this a family blessing, and then I've put after it a spiritual family. And that's how I, I want to introduce this, this concept, that there are, there are people who embrace the same hope that he had of, of inheriting the promise, and that they are of the same mind. So when, when you're of the same mind, um, and in this case, as I said, it's uh, a spiritual mind that, that we refer to a lot. There's a oneness, there's a desire um, to be able to, to be part of that family, um, to be called children of Abraham, as we saw from Galatians. <clears throat> so the last part then is, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. And this is an international promise, um, or portion of this promise, as, as I uh, well, over there in world number four, it's an international uh, flavor, if, if you like. It's, it's available to all. There, there, there's no holding back as to who can or who can't be a part of this. In all family, in these shall all families of the earth be blessed. And when you think about the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, in, in, in giving him in personal sacrifice so that man can be saved, you can see how it is very much an international promise that was given to Abraham. But the work of the Lord Jesus Christ wasn't just for the Jews. It, it was available to all in the salvation that was offered through, through his work. So you can see there's, there's a very clear fabric that is established in the promises. We've already looked at Galatians and how Galatians views a lot of this and, and Romans. Um, in the teachings of the New Testament, and you can now see in, in, in stepping through these very, very uh, clearly um, how there's a, there's a whole lot more than just a, a promises given to a, to a man who you know happened to, to do the right thing and, and um, um, desire to to have what was promised to him. Genesis 13 verse 14 
um, through 18. The Lord said to Abram after the lot was separated from him, so we've moved a little bit in time. Lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. The land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. Okay? Now, I've just highlighted out these words forever here because now we're introducing another component into the promises that were given to Abraham is, well, Abraham, you're not just going to move in and, you know, you'll be there for a while and you'll be prosperous and then you'll die and, you know, you bring kids and kids and take over and we'll keep going. Um, this forever is introducing a, a new concept which we as humans, again, have little trouble in just grasping, and that is that he will have this land physically, he will be in this land forever, it will be an eternal inheritance that he will live forever to partake in. We're going to look at that a little more in detail um, in, in a moment, but I, I wanted to call that out to you, they're very critical key words. Now, of course, verse 15, all the land which has to be will I give it. Abraham is standing on the earth. He is looking at, and we've already seen some, some places, um, Bethel and Ai, so we know the general area that is in the land of Canaan. He's standing in that place, and he's being told, Abraham, you will have this forever. It's a place on the earth. That's, that's very important um, as part of the, uh, the, the gospel message that the kingdom that Jesus is to establish is going to be on the earth. And it's going to be a, a kingdom that will last forever. So verse 16 of Genesis 13, I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it, in the breadth of it, and I will give it unto thee. Um, so then Abraham moved to a, a, a place uh, called Hebron. Um, down in verse 18. So you can see we've already established then uh, one point further and that is that there is an eternal component to this blessing given to Abraham. Acts chapter 7, so we're going back to the New Testament now. Um, just, just for a moment, New Testament teaching and uh, I'm going to start in verse 3. He was told, get thee out of thy country from thy kindred. So you remember, we, we looked those words in, in uh, Genesis 12. Come to the land that I will show thee. Then came he out of the, the land of the Chaldeans, dwelt in Haran, and from thence, when his father was dead, he removed him into this land where he now dwell, which is the land of Israel, uh, in Canaan, as it was referred to back then. And he gave him none inheritance in it. No, not so much as to set his foot on. Yet he promised that he would give it to him for a possession and to his seed after him, when as yet he had no child. So now we're introducing this idea that Abraham was told things that he couldn't prove. He, he, he was told that he would receive things that he wasn't, couldn't even see. And he was told that his seed, his children, would inherit when he didn't even have children. So we're introducing this idea that he was having to challenge himself. Mentally, he was having to say, eh, really? Sounds good, but I didn't even have kids. How would this be? So you, you, you can see that in, in order for a man to remove himself and his family away from his extended family and the city he grew up in to a place he'd never been before, and told that his kids were going to inherit when he didn't even have them. And in fact, we're told uh, in, in uh, uh, Genesis chapter 11 that his wife Sarah was barren. She was unable to have children. That you would have to kind of challenge a little bit and wonder, well, should I pack up the family and, and, and move to this place? Do I really believe this? And so you can see that Abraham, there was something unique. And, and that's, that's the part that you know, we've referred to already, this, this component of faith that is uh, it's very real. It's not just something that you have. It's, it becomes part of you in order for somebody to be, to be moved. Um, and, and that's what I want to look at right here from Hebrews chapter 11. Um, 
By faith, there it is. Abraham, when he was tried, he, he offered up Isaac that he might receive the promises, offered up his only begotten son. Um, verse 18, of whom it was said that in Isaac's side shall thy seed be called, Hebrews 11 verse 19, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. Now, what I've done is I've moved you forward a little bit in time to the point where Abraham now does have a son in Isaac. Um, and in this case, Hebrews 11 is saying, look, here is this same characteristic of faith that Abraham has already exhibited once in saying, okay, I, I, I'll, I'll accept you know, the, the, the promises that were given and I'll remove my family, even though I don't have children. At this point in time, later on, once the, the child of promise was uh, coming in, in Isaac, um, he was, you might recall the story, uh, Abraham was asked to go and offer up Isaac and the child of promise, the one that was supposed to carry the seed on from generation to generation, <coughs> holding the promises. Abraham was asked to go and um, offer him up and Abraham went to the point where he was about, as you probably know from the story, to kill Isaac before he was stopped. And at, at that point, his, his faith, 100% faith in God's ability to be able to take what we would see as a final act, he, he was willing to go through that act and killing the child of God. Because, and Hebrews tells us why, he knew, he accounted that God was able to raise him up even from the dead. So Abraham was very comfortable with this concept that people can be raised from the dead, that there is resurrection. Abraham believed in resurrection. And that's very important because you remember that Abraham uh, was given uh, the promises, and we're going to look like a little later on in Hebrews. Again, he received none of them. He's dead. So it takes a lot of faith. I'm not just talking a little bit of faith. We're talking a lot of faith someone to go through the actions that he did, to even be dead and not having received them, and yet he will be raised. And he believed that he would be raised. This is the teaching of Jesus. Jesus actually said to them, go away and tell John what things you've seen and heard, how the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised to the poor, the gospel is preached. Okay. So what we're doing now is, is again, showing that we're adding this another layer about the, the gospel that was given to Abraham is that it includes resurrection. It includes this ability for a person to be very comfortable and believe that God has the power to raise people even from the dead, which for, for many of us is considered to be uh, the, the final point in, in a person's life, as we know so Romans uh, 6 verse 20. For when you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. What fruit had you then in those things whereof you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. So we're very familiar with this. We are human. We sin, we die. Death is the end. But now, being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness. And the end is everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So look at what we've come to then. The ability for people to be taken out of the article or out of death, to be raised from death, and to be given the characteristic of living forever, of being able to have everlasting life, and it was done as a gift. It was given as a gift um, from God to those who are of, of faith, who believe that, that it can happen. So you, you can see, we, we looked at, at Genesis, and Genesis said, look at this land, I'll give it to you so you and you see forever. The New Testament teaching tells us exactly the same thing. If 
you believe in the gospel, the gospel has an element of eternity, forever. It's the same word. There is reinforcement. It's, it's nothing but a golden thread that runs uh, between them. Now, Abraham was told, and I've got to read book along here a little bit, but um, Abraham was told that he would have a seed that would come from his own bowels. Okay, this is um, a seed that would come from, from him and, and his wife. Uh, he initially was um, quite challenged with this whole idea because, as we know from Genesis 11, verse 30, Sarah was barren. Um, but in Genesis chapter 17 and verse 16, she was told, uh, he, he was told that the seed would come from Sarah. So there had to be some kind of miracle that had to take place. The power of God um, had, had to be um, you know, used in this situation for this to be able to happen. This is basically impossible. Um, verse uh, 6 here is, is very important. So we we'll go back to verse 5. He brought him forth the boy. He said, Abraham, look toward heaven, tell the stars, if thou art able to number, he said, and, and he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord. And he counted it to him for righteousness. So now what we have is uh, this relationship between Abraham and God. That God told him, look, you know, Abraham, you're, you're going to have a seed. It's going to come from your own bowels. Uh, Sarah is, is, is barren. There's going to be a miraculous means for this to happen. The, the seed that will come will come from your, your marriage between you and Sarah. And he believed in the Lord. Even though it seemed physically impossible, he believed. It was accounted to him for righteousness. That is that characteristic of faith. To be able to believe in something that you can't see. <clears throat> now, uh, Galatians chapter 3. We'll skip back here for a moment. Galatians 3 verse um, 16. Um, now that Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. Now, what Galatians, what Paul in Galatians is telling us is, is that while well, God, God was telling Abraham, from you is going to come a family. It's going to come from your own bowels. There will be a family. There will be a seed. There is a specific seed that is going to come from your bowels. And that seed, as he points out here in Galatians, is Christ. And we've already looked at how the, the teaching of Christ in the gospel, the work of Christ in personal sacrifice, is woven now together with the promise that was given to Abraham. Because Abraham was told that you will have a seed, a specific seed, who will enable this to happen. Enable all these things to happen that the people um, will be able to inherit um, these, these promises as well. So, Abraham, when he heard this promise of this seed to come, the Lord Jesus Christ says, Your father Abraham, when he heard these things, rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it, and he was glad. It was good news. He, he heard about the work of this seed to come and he looked forward and he said, I can't wait for that to come. I can't wait for that to come. That is good news. So Abraham was looking and waiting for the return of uh, the, the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, um, who was his seed. So Genesis chapter 17 um, we're told, I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant. So there again we have the same repetition, everlasting. It's forever. It's for eternity. Um, to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed, verse 8, after thee, the land wherein thou art a stranger. So there again is the land. And we know the, 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 the whole world. Um, uh, the boundaries of the land, we'll look at that in a second, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. This possession is going to take place on the earth, and I will be their God. In blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven, and the sand which is on the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. 
and in thy sin shall all nations of the earth be blessed. This is the seed, the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, who was a man of sin. This is how it was going to happen. That thy seed, in thy seed, in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, will all nations of the earth be blessed because of obedience. That same characteristic again of faith. <clears throat>
could go through her story and see that there was a development in her life that she had to go through. It's well documented. She developed faith. So can we. It's a challenge that we need to take on. They never receive the promises. They're dead. They're in that cave. I think uh, yeah, a little sketch of a cave from Vincent Van Gogh. I don't know. Okay, it doesn't matter. He's dead. He's dust. And yet, um, they believe that they would rise from the dead in order to be, have, have the uh, inheritance, um, which has been well documented where that inheritance is in the land of Israel surrounding that city um, of Jerusalem, or particularly Hebrews 12 and verse 22, you come unto Mount Zion, the exact location, Mount Zion, uh, which is basically covered up by the city of, of Jerusalem today. Um, but that Mount Zion, which is the, the apple of, of God's eyes, the place where this, that the kingdom um, will be established, where Abraham will possess um, on, uh, and, and with his family eternally. That is the hope of the promises. That's the hope of the gospel. We've seen it from all the New Testament together. And, and our challenge, you know, moving forward, um, is obviously to, to, to look at all of the facets that surround not just what the scripture presents, but how we choose to want to interact with it. So that's the challenge I'll leave for you tonight.